Hey, Peter, good to see you again. Hey, Matt, nice to see you. Yeah, so the last time we were talking, I think it was in October at an event, and you were predicting that Donald Trump would not win re-election. And I want to I want to spend today talking about um, Trump public policy leading into Biden public policy. I'm sure the short answer of that is we're totally screwed, but but let's maybe dig into that. But but I was thinking about it at the time, but for the fact that everything was so weird in 2020, it would be quite normal for an incumbent president with an economy in shambles to to lose reelection. Is was that the basis of your prediction? Well, remember, I predicted that Trump would be a one termer from the day he was elected. In fact, a lot of people were saying that he was going to be the new Ronald Reagan. And I said it was more like the new Jimmy Carter, only with the political parties reversed because um, Carter came to office when the economy was weak and promised to make it better. He was going to be an agent of change. He was an outsider. You know, he was a peanut farmer. He wasn't part of the Washington establishment. And so, the, you know, the electorate turned to uh, to Carter. And then, of course, Carter simply continued the failed policies of Nixon, Johnson. And so things got worse. And then uh, the electorate made a, a turn in the other direction and went to Ronald Reagan. And, you know, Ronald Reagan was far too right wing uh, to be elected before Carter. But things got bad enough during Carter that the public was willing to try you know, a different type of Republican than, you know, the Rockefeller type Republicans. And so I said the same thing would happen in reverse with, with Trump, that Trump would come into office promising to drain the swamp and make America great again, but that he would fail miserably because he would simply continue the failed policies he inherited from Obama, which are the ones that he inherited uh, from Bush, and that when he ran for reelection, the economy would be in worse shape than when he took over, which was the case. Uh, despite all the hoopla about the booming economy under uh, Trump, it never boomed. All that boomed was the debt. We borrowed more than ever before. We had the biggest trade deficits in history, the biggest budget deficits in history, even before COVID made them worse. Uh, but the whole thing was a fantasy. I mean, all we had was a stock market bubble. But the underlying trends uh, continued to stay in place. And so all the bad things that was happening all the things that Trump criticized as a candidate, all that continued. And remember, as a candidate, he talked against the Fed. He was he, you know, he he called out the Fed for cheap money. When he became president, he wanted money to be cheaper than ever. He was the biggest cheerleader for the Fed, not the biggest critic. He only criticized them for not printing enough money. And, and so I knew that the economy would be worse after four years of Trump, and that when Trump ran for re-election, a lot of the you know, Reagan Democrats that, you know, that, that came back to vote for him, the blue collar guys in the Midwest who were tired of all the lies from the Obama administration or the lies from Wall Street. And they knew that the economy was not good. And now Trump promised to change things. And so they voted for him. I knew that after four years, when they were in even worse shape than they were before, that they would not buy into that false promise again. And so I always expected Trump to lose. And, you know, those expectations were met. Uh, and, and in fact, not only did Trump lose, but the Democrats, the Republicans lost the Senate. So now uh, the Democrats have not only the White House, but they have Congress. So I noticed that uh, the governor of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, and the mayor of Chicago are suddenly discovering that locking down their economies is is really bad and there's really no evidence that lockdowns were were preventing the spread of the virus and this seems to coincide with the incoming new president and and I wonder was there ever a time uh, say pre-lockdown where you were thinking that Trump might actually squeak by because the economy was was looking okay it wasn't looking great but it was looking okay but but clearly the lockdown sort of sealed his fate well you know actually covid may have given the president an excuse to kind of blame everything on COVID. And it might have given him, you know, get a jail free card on the economy because, hey, it's not my fault. Everything was great. And, you know, COVID is the problem, you know. So he may have even lost worse if, if it wasn't for COVID. 
Um, but, you know, COVID is the excuse that keeps on giving right now. I mean, the politicians love it uh, because it's now used to justify all sorts of socialist programs. Uh, in fact, a lot of people want COVID to continue. There are a lot of people that don't want to go back to work. They'd rather just collect unemployment checks that in many cases exceed what they used to earn when they actually had a job. And most people prefer leisure to working. Uh, so if you can get paid more not to work than you earn when you do work, uh, you know, you have all these people that don't want to go to work. And yeah. the government is making that possible. And now you have all these states that were broke and municipalities. Now they have an excuse. Now we need all this government money because, you know, COVID is not our fault. Right. This is the big thing. Nothing's anybody's fault anymore. So everybody gets free money from the government because it's not their fault. So like uh, um, you, you talked about this on your podcast and and a shout out to the Peter Schiff podcast. You, you guys, if you aren't listening to it, you absolutely have to check it out. Um, I think it was uh, a couple days ago you were talking. Well, it was it was right after the uh, the Senate defeat in Georgia where Trump came out after legislation had essentially been finalized saying, I want two thousand dollar checks for everybody. Um, now, there, there might have been an argument for for instead of spending the trillion dollars that they spent uh, primarily on expanding government, they, they might have reallocated that money. But at that point, it couldn't be done. So they he kind of set up Republicans as the bad guys that wouldn't give out even more free money. Yeah. I mean, that really stabbed some Republicans in the back because now he put them in the position of having to deny the checks. And that, of course, allowed Biden to frame the Georgia elections as a referendum on those $2,000 checks. Vote Democrat, collect $2,000. Vote Republican, don't collect $2,000. So for most voters, that was an easy decision to make. I'd rather have $2,000 than not. And so basically it was a bribe. Vote Democrat and we'll give you $2,000. And you know, I've been saying on my podcast, if you give the voters a choice between two Democrats, they'll pick the Democrat every time. And, you know, the Republicans tried to get into a bidding war with the Democrats on who could promise the most free stuff. And the Republicans can't win that election. You know, once the Republicans accept the false premise that government has all this free stuff to divvy up, uh, they've lost the race. Republicans have to, you know, tell the truth that the government has nothing. The government doesn't have any, any money to give out. It only has what it steals. You know, it can only give to some people if it takes from other people. But the problem is, a lot of times, it gives and takes from the same people. A lot of people don't realize that while the government is giving the money with their left hand, they're picking their pocket with their right hand. And in many cases, the government takes more money away from you that you can't see than it gives you uh, that you can see. And I think the way a lot of this is going to manifest itself over the next you know, four years is going to be in a rise in cost of living. All the money that we're printing, so these $2,000 checks don't bounce, right? So all these people who no longer produce, uh, they don't help provide services, they don't produce goods, but they get money from the government and now they go out and spend it, the cost of living is going to go through the roof. Everything that Americans uh, buy is going to be a lot more expensive. And that means people are going to buy less stuff because they can't afford it. And that added cost is a government tax. That is the price Americans are going to pay for uh, bigger government under Biden. So I know you talk about this a lot, but it's it's worth reminding people. And I know people that watch your show or my show probably know this already, but there's only three ways to spend money you don't have if you're the government. You can raise taxes, you can borrow, or you can print more money or expand the, the money through uh, the expansion of credit. Um, you talk a lot about the second and third and the negative impacts that that has. Um, and Trump didn't seem to care about any of that stuff. I, a lot of people sort of compare him to the Tea Party, but to me, he was sort of the anti-Tea Party in the sense that he didn't care about the budget, he didn't care about the debt, he didn't care about the Federal Reserve and, and all of this, this transfer of wealth that happens when we expand the money supply, um, which makes him, it's sort of like, uh, this is going to sound hyperbolic, but it's it's Keynesianism on steroids, much like you would see in uh, Venezuela. Yeah, come, uh, you know, Trump came to Washington to bury the Tea Party, not to praise it. You know, he was a false prophet. I said that from uh, early on. You know, he claimed to be a conservative, but he's not. He was a populist. 
Uh, you know, he he railed against socialism, but then he advocated socialist policies. I mean, he really, for all the talk about how bad Obamacare was, he loved Obamacare. He just wanted to rename it Trump Care. I mean, that was all Trump was, was branding. He rebranded NAFTA, uh, the USMCA. He didn't really change the deal. He just put a new label on it and then pretended it was the greatest trade deal ever, even though it was substantially the same as the worst trade deal ever. Uh, you know, the, the whole trade war uh, with, with China was, was, was a bunch of nonsense. Uh, Trump made government bigger. You know, he, he, he signed every spending bill that hit his desk. You had to go back to like 1880 to find a president who served a full term who vetoed fewer bills than Trump. So he was a rubber stamp for the swamp. You can't drain the swamp if, you know, you're not cutting off the revenue to the swamp. Uh, so, you know, yes, he took credit for cutting taxes, but he ignored the fact that he made government bigger and more expensive. So we didn't get that government for free. We still had to pay for it. He just pretended that, that we didn't. So, you know, Trump, the worst thing I think that Trump did is he moved the Republican Party so far left that he made he or he gave room for the Democrats to go socialist and not appear to be uh, out of the mainstream. I mean, the, the socialist parties of the Democrats are no longer seen as radical because of how far left the Republicans have, have moved now because Trump is now considered far right. How is that far right? You know, he's he's a big government guy. You know, and, and now he's he represents the far right. He represents the smallest government could get. Somehow he represents fiscal responsibility. And, you know, no, I mean, you know, he, he so he, he really hurt, I think, the party by destroying uh, what it supposedly stood for. I don't know what the Republican Party stands for now. Uh, and Trump was so popular within the Republican Party. And what really bothered me is so many Republicans pretended that the Trump economy was great so they could take credit for it as if Trump's policies were the reason that the economy was so good. The economy was never good. It was just a bigger bubble. And it was the Fed that was more to blame for the bubble than Trump because the Fed monetized all those deficits in a way that pushed up stock prices and real estate prices and made everybody feel richer and so we can go deeper and deeper into debt. Uh, but the actual problems that Trump inherited got much worse. And now we're going to have to deal with the consequences. So my uh, friend Justin Amash tweeted out, I think it was a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, where he documented the process. We've been picking on the executive branch. We've been picking on uh, Donald Trump. Uh, let's let's pick on Republicans in Congress for a while, because what, what Amash documented was the the process of taking away the voice of any member of Congress that wanted to offer amendments or alternatives to this 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 massive omnibus, we're going to jam everything into these massive spending bills, and you can either vote yes or no. Um, and it was actually Republican speakers, uh, Paul Ryan and and John Boehner before him, that created this this sort of uh, mega powerful speakership. And Nancy Pelosi was like, "Well, thank you, I'll I'll, I'll run with that." Um, and I can't tell the difference. Uh, I had Rand Paul on my show a couple months ago, and he was he was sort of uh, criticizing, maybe even make fun, making fun of his colleagues for drawing a line in the sand in the Senate. They were not going to spend more than a trillion dollars in in unpaid for uh, COVID relief or whatever you wanted to call it. it. All it all went to government. It didn't actually go to people, and that was the new normal. That they were only going to spend a trillion. And now, um, you know, Joe Biden's coming forward with uh, 1.9 trillion. I think it's sort of comical that we're expecting Joe Biden to offer a different vision for America's future, and he's basically offering just more of the same. This is what we've been doing all of 2020: is just yeah. spending trillions of dollars we don't have. Yeah, look, I, I pointed out on my podcast the minute the Republicans offered a trillion, they lost the debate. The minute you concede that spending borrowed money is a good thing, well, then you've already lost the argument. And if, it's, if, if spending a trillion dollars that you don't have is good, why isn't spending two trillion better? They needed to make the point that we shouldn't be spending anything. In fact, if you really want to stimulate the economy, the way you do that is cutting government spending, not increasing it. Because once you understand that the government only has what it takes out of the economy, then you recognize that government spending is a burden on the economy. It's a burden that the economy 
a must bear. Now, when the economy is strong and everything is good, well, maybe we can afford the burden. But when the economy is struggling, then you want to lighten that burden. Then the government needs to free up resources back into the private sector. Hey, the private sector is struggling. We've got this pandemic. What can government do to help? Well, let's find a way to ease the burden. Let's cut back on our spending. So maybe we can lower taxes or let's take some of these regulations that are just unnecessarily running up the cost of doing business. Let's get rid of those regulations, you know, because businesses are struggling. They didn't do that. It's like, let's make government bigger. It's like you got somebody trying to run a race and, you know, they've already got a, a, a pack, you know, full of weights on it. And you think, well, let's put us, let's put some more weights in the pack. Maybe that'll make them run faster. No, get rid of the weights that is that are already slowing them down. Uh, but you know, the ones the Republicans said we want a trillion. That was it. It's over. They had no way to win. So you know, they're a bunch of cowards. By by my count, um, I may only need one hand to count the number of consistent fiscal conservatives in the House and Senate. Maybe maybe a few new ones like Nancy Mace, who just got elected. Uh, we will see what what she's doing, but there are no fiscal conservatives left in Washington. No, and look, any any that are there almost look like hypocrites because you know they they were not making that much noise uh, when Trump was running up the deficits. So how do you now criticize Biden without being a hypocrite? It's very difficult. So you know what put the brakes on Obama was the Republican Congress in 2010 and the Tea Party. And, uh, you know, Obama would have spent a lot more had it not been for some of the pushback of the Republicans. That's not going to be there. I mean, that's the reason I talked about Trump being, I mean, Trump being a reverse Jimmy Carter. Because after Jimmy Carter, we got Ronald Reagan, right, who was far more free market oriented than Nixon or, or Ford, right? He wasn't a Rockefeller Republican. He was a Goldwater, right? And the country rejected Goldwater, uh, you know, soundly uh, earlier, but then they embraced a Reagan who was really to the right even of Goldwater. Well, that's what is happening in reverse. I think what we're going to get with Biden is even further to the left than what we had with, with, with Obama. And, and I think even if Biden himself wasn't as big a liberal, He's the, the, the Democratic Party is so much further left. I mean, I pointed out that I thought the most significant aspect of the 2020 race or the 2016 race was not that Trump won, but how well Sanders did uh, against Clinton in the primary and the fact that the, the, the Democratic Party had moved so far left. And now you've got the rise of, you know, AOC and the squad uh, and, 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 and this is really where the Democrats are beholden to that, to that wing of the party. And I think they're really going to be driving the legislative agenda. And what's going to be empowering them is going to be the idea that everything is free. You know, the Republicans have already established that precedent that deficits don't matter. So if they don't matter, they don't matter. So Green New Deal, so health care, you know, for everybody. Forgive all the student loans, free college for everybody universal basic income. We, everybody can have whatever we want because everybody's entitled to it. It's a right. It's a human right. And, you know, who knows, reparations, whatever. But all this stuff's going to be paid for, which means by a printing press, which means none of it is paid for. And we're going to destroy the dollar. And we're in for, you know, a currency crisis, a dollar crisis, potentially hyperinflation. And, you know, Americans are about to experience economic destruction on a scale never seen in the United States. Talk about uh, you. You, talk, you pointed out something because a lot of us have been predicting a a correction for a long time, um, going all the way back to 2008, and the way that we monetized all of that debt and we bought all of all of those uh, toxic assets, and we've been spending with with a few uh, blip years where the Tea Party actually forced Republicans to be fiscally responsible. We've we've been spending and borrowing and printing and expanding. Um, the one thing that's different, uh, according to you, is that China has stopped borrowing our debt. Explain, explain your view on that. Yeah, well, the reason that Americans have been able to get away with this is because we've been able to continue to go deeper into debt to finance our consumption and to keep the bubble uh, expanding. 
Uh, but China and other foreign governments are no longer buying our bonds. And, and, and therefore, we need to find another buyer. And there are no other buyers. It's just a Fed. And so when the Fed buys, they have to print money. When China buys, they're not printing money. In fact, what happens is the Chinese companies sell us products, and then the money they earn is, is loaned back to us because the Chinese government buys up those dollars and then buys treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. So that's what's keeping the economy going. We get all these Chinese products that we didn't have to produce, uh, and the Chinese you know, you know, just take the money they earned and, and, and loan it right back to us uh, by buying our bonds. So we no longer are riding the China gravy chain. That was the, the irony of what Trump was saying. The Chinese were subsidizing our economy. It wasn't the other way around. They were, we were taking advantage of them. We were getting all their stuff for free. So that, that, that's going to stop. But the other dynamic, the other, the other factor at play was the, the Ponzi scheme known as Social Security. Because a lot of the bonds that the government was selling were being bought up by the so-called Social Security trust funds. And so that money was available. But now, given the fact that so many people are no longer working, and in fact, Trump has a, you know, a, a payroll tax holiday where even the people that are working aren't even paying into Social Security to the fullest, to the extent that they are supposed to. And you have so many people that are just taking early retirement because they're not working anyway. The Social Security trust funds are hemorrhaging. They're selling treasuries constantly. They're, in fact, they're going to run out of treasuries probably by the end of the decade. Uh, but so now you've got the biggest buyers of treasuries, foreign central banks like China and Social Security Trust Fund, they're now unloading treasuries. So the Federal Reserve is now the only buyer. And so that's just massive money printing. And that's going to you know, cause the dollar to crash. I mean, the dollar has been artificially you know, propped up. Uh, by the false belief that we're going to get our house in order, that we're going to eventually cut spending, that we're going to allow interest rates to normalize. Remember the Federal Reserve, we're going to normalize rates. We're going to taper. We're going to, you know, but not, all of that was a lie. I mean, I said that was a lie from the beginning. I was the one guy out there saying the Fed is never going to normalize rates. They're never going to shrink the balance sheet. It's QE infinity. It was the false belief of future normalization and, and fiscal responsibility that kept the bid in the dollar. But the world is getting wise to this scam, and the whole thing is going to unravel. And you know the fact that it's gone on as long as it has just made the problem that much worse. So that means the, the, the end game is a lot worse. The collapse is a lot worse. And unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the way the, the country is headed right now, when we end up in this massive economic crisis, the odds that we're going to turn to capitalism to solve the problem seem slim. I mean, we may go all in and become a complete, you know, totalitarian society, you know, social society where we, we, we blame it all on capitalism. See, this is what happens when you have capitalism and greed and corporations. So we need to nationalize the means of production completely. The government needs to own all the corporations. We need to own all the businesses. And, you know, and we just become, you know, like the former Soviet Union or, you know, uh, Cuba or any, any of these other countries. Uh, that's the danger, right, that, that capitalism takes the blame for the disaster that government uh, has created. Well, wow. so that's uh, <laughs> that's a little bit depressing to hear. But I um, so so let me uh, let me give you a chance to, to pull us out of the fire here um, in. 1992, Bill Clinton was elected, and he promised Hillary Care and a big government stimulus, not big by today's standards, but big by that time. The backlash in 1994 was Republicans who hadn't been in control of the House for 40 years yeah. took that back and forced Black Bill. With America, yeah, back. yeah, that's the, the, the salad days when, when Republicans had credibility as fiscal conservatives because they hadn't really been in charge of anything for a long time. Um, the backlash from Barack Obama trying to do exactly the same thing, a massive stimulus and, and implementation of Obamacare was the, um, the Tea Party wave of 2010, which he writes in his own book. Um, those guys, he's not a fan of the Tea Party because those guys kept him from doing many of the, many of the things he wanted to do. Is there, is there a counter-revolution possible of fiscal conservatism, because when things are really bad, as in the Wall Street bailout of 2008, that's when I saw the Tea Party start to emerge. 
Uh, yeah, it's hard to imagine that it would be able to come back so quickly after being so thoroughly destroyed by Trump. Um, you know, will all the Tea Party guys, I mean, not the Tea Party guys, the MAGA guys, will all those people suddenly become concerned about deficits in big government when they weren't concerned about it at all when Donald Trump was president? That's why it seems like it's so hard to do such a complete 180 uh, and, and, and now be against everything that you were just for. I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, politicians are some of the biggest hypocrites out there. But the question is, uh, can the public actually do that? I mean, you know, the, ironically, I believe that there is a portion of Trump's base that actually wants small government, free, you know, capitalism, libertarian, sound money, gold standard, constitution. And they just erected a false champion in Donald Trump. They saw in Trump everything they wanted him to be, even though he was none of those things. And I think he did a good job sometimes of throwing the red meat to, to those factions. People paid more attention to what he said and not what he actually did. Uh, but, you know, given the popularity now of modern monetary theory and the fact that, you know, the deficits have been so big for so long without any you know, observable, readily observable negative consequences. I mean, I could see 20, 30 years ago, oh, no, we can't risk these big deficits. The national debt is almost $28 trillion, and the interest rates are at record lows, right? So people are like, whoa, oh, because people used to say, well, if we have too big a deficit, it's going to push up interest rates. It's going to crowd, crowd out. Well, what do you mean? We got the biggest deficits ever. We got the lowest interest rates ever. So- since we haven't had the crash that people like me were warning would be the consequences of all this debt, at this point, there's no credibility left with the, with the people who have been worried about the debt. It's the people who have said there's nothing to worry about who think they've been vindicated. You see, we told you, right, that Clark Krugman has already taken so many vip, victory laps. I don't even think he has any rubber left on his, on his sneakers. Uh, for, ah, I told you so. I told you so. So we're at the point now where th there's really no pushback. And yeah. so we're just going to we're just going to push this until it until it breaks. Right. We're going to keep going until we are over the cliff and then we're going to get a crisis. That's the only thing. The only thing that's going to stop the spending and stop the debt is a dollar crisis where inflation runs out of control. The dollars in free fall. Prices are soaring. And, you know, my gut is the original the initial reaction to soaring prices is going to be price controls, you know, like we had with with Nixon. Maybe maybe we'll get them under under um, under Biden. I mean, I thought they might have happened sooner, but we were able to kick the can down the road. But a free fall in the dollar is going to send prices through the roof. Um, and so the government might initially just try to vilify the, the businesses that are raising prices, not the Federal Reserve that's destroying the value of the money, because uh, that's really what's going up. Prices aren't rising. The money is losing value. That's all that's happening. And the prices are simply a reflection of how much value the money that you're using to buy stuff has lost. So I, I have a lot of friends who are uh, supportive of President Trump. And, you know, he, my Tea Party friends uh, went one of two ways. Um, in my case, I actually left the Republican Party and joined the Libertarian Party because of Trump. And because of a, a lot of the things you're talking about were, were pretty obvious. Um, I'm old enough to remember that the, the grassroots mantra of the Tea Party was fiscal responsibility, limited government, and uh, reigning in executive power. Well, if that's the criteria of, of Trumpism, he failed on all of those things. Um, I think the counter-revolution is not fiscal conservatism. It's probably not within the Republican Party because, as you say, they have no credibility. But it's some sort of uh, localism that demands that, that Washington, D.C. not dictate every aspect of their lives. And and the one thing that I think Trump did well was he played the culture war very well. He was he was the counter to sort of woke authoritarian leftism, and he at least convinced people that that he was the opposite of that. But the real opposite of that would would be sort of that live and let live, uh, let's solve things at the local level. Let's not go to Washington D.C. And I'm hoping that 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 is the counter revolution. So Trump, I mean Trump certainly didn't pass as many regulations as a Democrat would have uh, during that four years. I mean, obviously, Biden's going to make up for lost ground and we're going to start 
you know, bogging down American businesses with even more uh, red tape. And clearly the, the justices that he appointed, nominated to the Supreme Court were much more likely to strike down something that was unconstitutional. Uh, not that they will, but they're probably more likely to than the, the justices that would have been nominated by Hillary Clinton and that will be nominated if Biden gets the opportunity to do that. Um, so it, it, he didn't do everything bad. But the problem is by pretending to make America great again, pretending we had a great economy when we didn't, uh, that does a lot of damage. Because, you know, people are going to think we tried free market capitalism under Trump and you see it didn't work, you know, but we didn't. We didn't try any of that. We didn't cut spending. Uh, we didn't, you know, restore sound money. We didn't let the bubbles deflate, you know. So Trump just pretended that we got a full dose of capitalism and, and limited government when we just got more uh, helpings of, of, of socialism. So what after Joe Biden passes and I assume he can pass 1.9 trillion in in new spending and that that includes by the way uh, some something really odious which is bailing out states like California and New York that have absolutely destroyed their own economies their state economies with with lockdowns um, what comes after that he's talking about a $15 minimum wage he's uh, despite his his campaign promises to Pennsylvania he's very much anti-fossil fuels how does this play out, and and is any of this stuff stoppable? Well, it'll stop with the, the dollar crashes, but between now and then, you know, the the one point nine trillion is just a down payment on an even bigger amount. Uh, you know, once they start bailing out the states and the municipalities, there's a moral hazard that's going to make the problems even bigger. Uh, more states are going to want bailout money. Uh, the states that aren't getting bailed out are going to feel like suckers. And so they're going to act more fiscally irresponsible. I think the Federal Reserve is actually going to start monetizing all the state debt, too. I think they're going to start buying muni bonds and things like that. Uh, so it's going to be the same problem that the European Central Bank has, only much bigger, because we got 50 states uh, and, and a much bigger uh, moral hazard as every state is trying to push off the cost of their own profligacy on their neighboring states. So this is bad, of course, to the extent that they pass the increase in the minimum wage, which I think they will do. I mean, they may try to limit the impact by having it phase in over time so that the full destruction isn't evident you know, right away. Um, but obviously, the minimum wage destroys jobs. I mean, that's what it does. I mean, it's basically a, a law that says if you don't have $15 worth of productivity to sell, it's illegal for you to uh, have a job. You know, you can't go and accept an, an employment offer of $14 an hour or $12 an hour. Even if you think that's a good offer, uh, illegally, the employer can't make it and you can't accept it. Now, the employer can pay you $15 an hour, but if, you're, if you can only contribute $12 an hour worth of productivity, why should any employer make that deal? It'd be a bad deal. Uh, so it's a terrible law. It, it hurts the most the people that it is intended to help. Um, the only thing good is that there's going to be so much inflation that pretty soon the, the $15 minimum wage may be irrelevant <laughs> as long as they don't uh, raise it again, because the government's going to destroy the value of the money. And so, you know, who knows where wages are going to end up being. But in real terms, uh, they're going to be a lot lower because inflation is going to destroy the value of the dollar. Yeah, like... Uh... I, I've already brought up Nicolas Maduro, but they keep passing massive expansions in the minimum wage, and it, it means nothing because their currency is total trash. Yeah. I mean, and so what difference does it make? 50, you know, just start adding zeros, 15, yeah. 150, you know, you know. And of course, that's also the argument. If $15 an hour minimum wage is good, why not 25? Why not 100? So you, uh, you'll, you'll correct me, but you're you're essentially... Um, bullish on commodities as a as a strategy to protect ourselves, and which is where the the destruction of of domestic uh, oil production and things like that become become a factor in in America's crisis. Uh, what do we what do we do to protect ourselves? Well, I mean, you get out of dollars. I mean, you have to recognize that inflation is really a tax, right? We talked about that at the beginning of the program. Uh, the government has to collect money to spend money. And one way it collects it is through inflation, right? If it doesn't tax it legitimately, it does it through inflation. So the government can either take my money, 
literally take the money I've earned and give it to somebody else through taxes, or it can just print up money and give it to somebody else. But they've still taken something from me. They've taken my purchasing power and they've transferred it to whoever got the new cash because that person who got the government money didn't contribute any goods and services to society, but he wants to take out the goods and services that I helped put in. And so prices go up. And so those price increases amount to a tax. And if you want to avoid the inflation tax, you have to avoid the dollar because the government is taxing your dollars, your savings, uh, your, you know, if you have an annuity or you have a, a pension or some type of fixed dollar payment or even your wages, you're getting paid and you're getting paid dollars, right? Inflation makes those dollars less valuable. So to the extent that you have dollars in your possession now, get rid of them, use them to buy something else. You know, and so I'm investing for my clients, I'm investing all around the world in productive assets, in companies. Many of the companies are in the resource sector. They're in the energy business. They're in the agriculture. They're in mining, but also utilities and property trusts and, and all sorts of companies that pay good dividends in foreign currencies. And my theme really is to recognize that the United States has really been a burden on the world. And to the extent that Americans collectively have lived beyond their means, and we certainly have, it's only because the rest of the world has lived beneath its means to make that possible. So I think when the dollar is no longer the world reserve currency and the world no longer subsidizes American profligacy and Americans can only consume what we produce and we can only borrow what we save, that's gonna free up resources for the rest of the world uh, people in other countries are now going to be able to reap the rewards of their hard work and, and consume what they produce. And as the world spends less of its savings on U.S. treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, that will mean there'll be more money to invest locally in productive assets. So I think this is, there's going to be a gigantic boom in the post-U.S. dollar reserve world. I think the emerging markets are going to finally really emerge as the U.S. submerges. And I think a lot of, you know, investors are going to make a lot of money. You know, I think a lot of people made money investing in the U.S., uh, it, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century. I mean, America was the up and coming power. And if you could see that, if you could read the writing on the wall and you came into the U.S. in 1890, 1900, 1910, and you started buying up businesses and buying up land and things, you, you became very, very rich. Well, I think things are changing again in the 21st century. America is the declining power. Uh, and, uh, you know, China and other emerging markets, particularly in, in Southeast Asia, are going to take the mantle. You know, unfortunately, there's more economic freedom there than there is here. Uh, you know, those countries have more in common with 19th century America than 21st century America does. You know, uh, we're emulating the failed social democracies, you know, the big socialist economies uh, we're following in their footsteps. We're not uh, following in our own. And, uh, and so I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here, not only to avoid the loss that is going to ravage most Americans, but to actually profit uh, from this major economic transition. Does that, um, does that correction that you're describing, it's, it's colossal and it'll be colossally painful, does that in any way put pressure on our political class not to do all the things you're predicting? Well, I mean, I, I don't think that our political class is going to feel any pressure until the crisis has already happened, right? Because as long as they can keep printing money and it has value, they're gonna keep doing it. It's after the crash and it no longer has value that now there's you know, you know, a, an impetus to change. But the question is, what will the American public accept? Who are they gonna blame? for their suffering and their misery? And, and what solutions are they going to accept as a political reality? Are they gonna accept that the, this problem and this misery is the result of the US government and the Federal Reserve and too much government spending and too much money printing? And the solution is the government get out of the way and you're on your own and let's let the free market you know, repair what the government and the Federal Reserve destroyed? Are they ready for that? Or are they ready for more handouts? And oh, you see, the, this is what happens when you have capitalism and this is greed and all this racism. You know, we need the government to come in and, and fix this. I mean, the, the, the public is pretty dumb, you know. Remember, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a vote, right? I mean, everybody gets a vote 
And uh, so it, it's hard to outvote the people that want something for nothing. Uh, the people that want, you know, a handout, right? They don't want freedom. They want free stuff. So I don't know. I mean, there's a part of me that is hopeful that from the ashes of this destruction, you know, we can rise something good. You know, I mean, that maybe it will be the impetus uh, to reject government and, and have a new American revolution and really embark on a journey to make America great again. I mean, it can be done. And in fact, you know, capitalism works so well in the 19th century, it would work even better now. I mean, we have a lot more capital. We have a lot more know-how scientific. We have, you know, we have, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure. We have technology that did not exist a couple of hundred years ago. So if capitalism were good then, it would work even better now. We just have to try it. What's, what's your What's, what's your, your opinion, opinion about, about third parties emerging, emerging from, from this chaos? chaos. Um, everybody, everybody knows the story of Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln and, and Republicans, Republicans emerging from from, from the, the chaos and the battle over over, over slavery and how that divided the country. Um, do, you do you think, think parties, parties like the Libertarian Party have the potential to become that alternative voice that is tolerant and fiscally responsible? I mean, you'd like to think so, but you know, look back at the 2016 election where you had two candidates that nobody really liked in Trump or Hillary Clinton, and everybody was holding their nose and voting for the lesser of two evils, yet the, the, the Libertarians couldn't really get more than 1% of the vote. Um, same thing now. I mean, so it, it seems like the Republicans and the Democrats have kind of a, a, a stranglehold on the political system. And it's hard to believe that anybody is going to be elected from outside that system. Now, Donald Trump came in uh, and, and infiltrated the Republican Party and was able to win as a Republican. Not that he was a game changer or anything, but I mean, I don't think he would have won if he was a third party. Um, he was able to capture the nomination of the Republican Party, you know, whether somebody from outside can do that again, you know, we'll see. But it, it's hard. You know, you would think with social media, it would have been easier because you don't have the, the major networks now that are kind of like the gatekeepers. But now all of a sudden social media is clamping down, right? Facebook and Twitter. I mean, who, I mean, they seem to be shutting down. Um, you know, and anybody who's not, you know, fitting into the narrative. So they may be tools of the establishment now, too, to kind of prevent a third party from gaining traction. Um, you know, I mean, Ross Perot came kind of close. You know, he actually got into the debates. Um, but he's the only third party to make it. And, I, and he spent a lot of his own money. I mean, clearly, you know, if Donald Trump had spent a lot of money as a third party candidate and gotten high enough in the polls he may have been able to make it into the presidential debates. Yeah. Um, but look, it, it, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's hard to imagine uh, a third party breaking this duopoly, you know, and if we do get a third party, here's the interesting thing. Most of the talk about a third party is a centrist party as if, the Republicans and the Democrats are so far apart that we need somebody in the middle. I mean, there isn't even enough daylight to have a middle between those two parties. They're both socialist big government parties. So the last thing we need is a party that's somehow in between <laughs> the, the Democrats and the Republicans. We need a party that's way further to the right <laughs> of where the Republicans are now on the political spectrum when it comes to economic freedom, right? We really need the Libertarian Party to be that third party. In fact, we don't need to create the third party. It's already there. The problem is it's been there since, what, the 1970s and hasn't managed to elect anybody to the federal government. There have been no congressmen even that have been elected as libertarians, you know. So it's, you know, let alone a president. Yeah. And, you know, and I have voted libertarian several times. I voted for Ron Paul when he ran for president as a libertarian, you know. And he ran against Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Just that when Ronald Reagan ran for re-election, I voted for Ron Paul. You, you know, since since Ross Perot, the the duopoly, as you call them, has erected all of these barriers to entry, and and we could document all of those because they 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 don't like the competition, and that they've been, I think they've been nervous since Ron Paul and the Tea Party and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, all of these outsiders sort of uh, tipping over their apple cart. 
Um, and, and you mentioned something that, I, and I want to wrap up on this, but I'm curious what you think about big tech and its, its uh, very aggressive um, lockdown of, of the incoming party's political enemies. And, and there's, a, there's a notion in public choice literature called regulatory capture, where big corporations use the, the legislative process to crowd out competition. This feels like, uh, there's not a word for it, but it feels like political capture where big tech that knows that Elizabeth Warren, knows that Joe Biden, knows everybody wants to break them up, to regulate them, to control them. Um, aren't they just buying a little bit of peace by, by punishing almost exclusively uh, uh, Trumpsters and conservatives and Republicans? Yeah. In, in fact, I made that exact point on, on my podcast the other day. And even before I get to that, I want to mention your, yeah, I mean, when you talk about uh, Ron Paul, I mean, he came close to actually capturing uh, the Republican Party. Uh, I think it was in a 2012 campaign where I think he really won Iowa, but they stole it from him and they, they found a way not to report it. They didn't they want to kind of to, to derail his momentum early on. I was involved in the 20, 2008 campaign as the economic advisor. So that's when he was first building. Uh, but he actually had a pretty strong power base by 2012. Uh, and the establishment really just, you know, uh, built a firewall to stop him because he really was a threat to the Republican Party, a much bigger threat than than uh, than Trump was. But to get to your, your your current question, absolutely. Look, you've got a new sheriff in town and the big tech companies realize that unlike Trump, really, I mean, because. Trump at least liked to talk about free markets and deregulation. So Trump was not really going to regulate these companies in a big way because it would have gone against what he supposedly stands for. But the Democrats love regulation. I mean, they, 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 they're not promising less regulation. They, they hate the free market. The more regulation, the better. So now you're a tech company, you're Facebook, you're Twitter, you're, you know, you're Google, and now you know Biden is coming in. And he's got all these new people that are going to make your life miserable with regulation and, 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 and taxation. And, and, and what are you going to do to curry favor, to, to try to, like, diffuse the situation? Oh, let's do them a favor. Like we're, we're on their team, right? Let's crack down on Trump and conservatives and, and to get out in front of that so that we can cozy up and get all buddies with this in, in administration that clearly – is a threat. It's like, you know, warming up to the mafia, right? So the big thug is on your block and he's going to burn down your, uh, your, your store and beat the crap out of you. So you have to start doing nice things so that he, he doesn't, he doesn't do that. In fact, he, you, ha, let him beat up your, your competitor, somebody else, your, your neighbor's store, you know, not mine. Uh, and so this is what's going on. I mean, it's not a coincidence that they waited until Trump is about to leave in order to do this. I mean, why didn't they do it three years ago? Because then Trump was had the power. He controlled all the regulators. But now that all that's going to be controlled by the Democrats, and I think they fear, I think business naturally fears the Democrats more than the Republicans, because the, 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 the Democrats are a bigger threat. You know, and that's one of the reasons, too, that big business contributes a lot of money to Democrats. You think, why are they doing that? Don't they realize that these are the guys that want to regulate them? Exactly. That's why they have to give them money to buy them off, to pay them off. See, the Republicans aren't as big a threat because in theory, they believe in freedom. So I don't have to buy off the politicians that, that, that claim they want free markets. I have to buy off the socialists who are going to regulate me unless I cave and I give them a bunch of money. Uh, so that's why you have all this corporate money uh, going to the Democrats, it's protection money. It's the same way that you know you give you know you 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 give money to the mob so that they you, they they leave you alone and they don't beat you up. And that's that's exactly what's going on. So it's more Don Corleone than than regulatory capture. Well, they're captured because they have they have the power. The government has yeah. all the power. That's why I keep saying, look, if you don't like big business lobbying and buying politicians. You got to take the power away from the politicians. That's the source of the problem. The problem isn't that businesses try to lobby to have that power used to their advantage. What, do you, what else are they going to do? The problem is that the government has the power in the first place. 
the Constitution was supposed to limit government power, but of course, the judges don't enforce it, and the government does whatever it wants. So we've got to reimpose the constitutional limits on the government, take away all that power so there's nothing to lobby for, so businesses don't have to worry about what government's going to do, and therefore they don't have to bribe them to leave them alone, or they don't have to try to get government power, because it's like, if I don't get government to use that power to hurt my competitor, my competitor is going to get government to use the power to hurt me. So it's a battle between who can use government power to use it to gain an advantage. I don't want anybody using government power to gain an advantage. If a business wants to gain an advantage, you know, let them build a better mousetrap. Let them, let them come up with a better product at a lower cost. That's the free market. But the government, it's whichever company can control the government that wins because they can take that government power and use it uh, to achieve uh, what they want. I want businesses to have to satisfy the consumer uh, to achieve what they want, not satisfy the government. Well said. So thank you, Peter. And uh, tell everybody where we can get more Peter Schiff. I know you do. Is I think it's a daily podcast, right? It's not daily. I do a couple a week, you know, two, sometimes three, you know, if a lot of stuff is happening. So you can listen to it at shiftradio.com, also on my YouTube channel, The Shift Report. Uh, so it's there. I mean, you know, just subscribe to my YouTube channel or just go to The Shift Radio and listen to my podcasts. Uh, you know, I still have some books. I haven't written any recently, but the most recent one is The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy. Uh, you know, obviously, we're a lot closer to that bankruptcy when I wrote the book, although I, I thought back then that it would have happened by now, although I didn't put an actual date on it. But it's as relevant now, maybe more so, as when I wrote it, I think, in 2013 is when I is the last rev revision. But I have some other books. You can get at shiftbooks.com or Amazon. Uh, most importantly, though, we discussed protect yourself, protect your wealth. Uh, inflation is going to wipe out a lot of Americans. If you don't want to be part of that, if you want to preserve and profit from the events that are going to unfold, I'm happy to help you do that. I mean, I'm perfectly positioned myself, I think, but I can help other people build the right portfolio. So you can talk to my brokers at Europe Pacific Capital, uh, at Europe Pacific Asset Management, Shift Gold. I mean, I'm, you know, the websites are there. You can find them, europac.com, uh, europepacfunds.com, Europe shiftgold.com. But make sure and do something. I mean, I don't know how much time we have left. I mean, we don't have much. I mean, the, t the clock is ticking. Uh, you know, this bomb's going to go off. You know, I don't know, you know, how long the fuse is, but it's already, you know, taken longer than I thought. But certainly I think what's happening now, COVID, Biden, the Democrats, whatever was slowing it down, I think we're about to speed up. So I, I would just hurry up. A assume it's going to happen tomorrow and, and get prepared. Okay, thank you, sir, for this very depressing conversation. <laughs> well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you know, forewarned is is forearmed. And I'm still look, I'm still optimistic. I'm not like, you know, I still hope for the best. You know, I'm planning for the worst, but I still hope that, you know, that we could turn this around. I do think that it's gonna have to get a lot worse before it gets better. We're gonna need a catalyst to do the right thing, but I still hope we do the right thing. I mean, we may not, but we could. And I'm I'm doing my best to spread the word and to yep. get people to understand uh, the problems and where they're coming from and the, and, and the only real solutions. Yeah, our only defense is, is knowing and acting on knowledge. So, so I agree 100% with that. Thank you again. Okay, take care. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.